Hey, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to go ahead and get started, but I have a couple announcements before I introduce the speaker for today. Um, let's see, a couple things uh, about the, um, the Future of Games talks. You, if you're not already subscribed to the mailing list that provides announcements about the talks, you should definitely get on the list. Uh, it's pretty low traffic, but it focuses on stuff that's either DGRC sponsored or very related to games, games research, and games education around the, around NC State and the, and the other universities here. So you can get on the list by going to the DGRC website, which is dgrc.ncsu.edu. And there on the front page, there's a link to the form where you can um, get on the list. Um, had you been on the list already, you would know that also next week we have our second uh, uh, Future of Games talk for the summer, which is Chris Hazard, uh, who is a PhD student from NC State, but also uh, co-author and founder of a company that's uh, building a game called Akron, which um, is a time travel game that got a lot of interesting buzz at the experimental gameplay session this year at GDC. Um, so be sure and check that out. It's next Wednesday, 10.30 in the morning in this room. Um, today's speaker is Sebastian Matias. He's a PhD candidate at the Chair of Computing in the Cultural Sciences and Research Assistant at the Laboratory for Semantic Information Technology at the University of Bamberg in Germany. And today he's going to be talking about geogames, getting gamers on the move. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So the talk uh, I'm going to give today is about our geogames project. It's about location-based gaming and the things we yeah, researched there. I will give you just in a minute an uh, overview of the talk, but let me just drop some lines about the region I'm coming from. So you might be interested in visiting us because we, are, we have the highest brewery concentration in the world. So in the city of Bamberg, we have around about nine breweries and in the outskirts, it's 200, uh, up to 900 breweries. So there's a lot of beer going on there that you might want to taste. So I'm from the Otto Friedrich University, Bamberg. Um, it's a rather old university, as all the things that are that come from Europe. So it's around about 350 years. Um, it was founded by two bishops, so it's more uh, yeah, Catholic. And today it has around about 8,000 students, so it's a rather small university. Uh, the city has 30,000 inhabitants, so one third of it our students. Um, we have uh, quite a few faculties there. Mainly they are from cultural science. The computer science department was only recently uh, introduced there, maybe five to uh, ten years ago. So it's rather new. And I'm from the faculty of computing in the cultural sciences. So we are the link between the cultural sciences and the computer science department. So we have very many interdisciplinary projects going on there. And today I want to talk about a new way of game interaction that we think will be the next big thing, um, maybe. So we are going with the classification by cognitive psychologist Motello, which um, classified space in three parts. That's the figural space, the vista space, and the environmental space. The figural space is just a space that you can touch with your fingers, so when you play a game with a joystick. And the whisper space is the space you can see where you move parts of your body, like the Wii. And the environmental space, which we think is the next space that will be yeah, explored by game interaction. So these location-based mobile games we developed are in the environmental space where the players have to move themselves to another location completely. So locomotion is a big part of it. And yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the talk has three parts. The first part is just introducing our GeoGames class of location-based games. So it's not one particular game, but a whole class of it. And the second part is uh, the most recent research we have done. It's the City Explorer game, and it's about um, a yeah, geo game with a purpose. I will go into detail just in a few minutes about that. And the third part is, um, 
I've prepared two assignments because I thought this would be a lecture, so maybe if I'm coming back, you can have some homework to do for the next talk, who knows. So this will be the third part. Um, but I want to start with the GeoGames framework and just a um, first example of it. I don't know if anybody knows the game Tic-Tac-Toe. Is it down here? Okay. Has it the same name here or? Okay. Then it's good. So our first game was just this simple idea of taking tic-tac-toe in the environmental space. So just build a location-based mobile game out of this simple game. So we developed a framework that can be used to transform or transfer any board or card game into the environmental space. So you just put the game board fields and yeah, just choose locations in a city, and the players have to move physically there to set a piece, an X or an O, uh, on the game field. Now, this looks rather simple, but it poses some um, rather interesting challenges when you design such a game. Um, I mean, the game rules are the same with the tic -tac The first who just goes to three locations in a row or a column or a diagonal wins the game. Now, the problem is that you get a synchronization problem. Because if you just take the game and put it in the environmental space and take out the alternating turns, because it's not much fun when you go out and have to wait until the other player sets a piece somewhere in the city. So it's um, a real-time gameplay. So everyone who sets um, moves to a location can just move to another location instantly. Um, but this poses this kind of problem because now the strategic element of the tic-tac-toe game isn't that much uh, of interest anymore because here every time the physical more speedy player wins every uh, geo tic-tac-toe game. So there's a kind of problem here which you have to solve. So how can we manage that the more slower player has a chance to win this game in a more strategic way? The first solution we came up with was this one, a space resource solution. So like in golf, you could introduce some kind of handicap for the slower player, uh, for the faster player, sorry, um, that he has to move um, more away to get to another location. But there's this is uh, not such a good um, yeah, solution because you have to put the geographic locations so that the faster player always has, has to move the longer way. But this is not always possible because sometimes you have a location-based game where um, you want the players to visit some points of interest in your city, some churches or whatever, and then you the, yeah, the locations are predefined by the game play or by the game designer so that the touristic attractions are in the game. So this spatial solution is not always possible. And you also have to know in advance which one is the faster player. So you have to yeah, just kind of make a pre-game where you, um, yeah, can decide which one is the faster player and then the faster player has to move the longer ways. So not a good solution. What we came up with um, after that was a temporal solution. So this one is not spatial but temporal. So um, players have to wait some kind of synchronization time. It's the same that you have in if you synchronize some uh, processing things in your processor. Um, so they just wait some time at the location and then they are allowed to move on. So in this example, here the X player is also, he is slower. He has a chance to reach and to counter the strategy of the O player by moving to this last square because the faster player has to wait at the second square some time and he has the time to get to this position. So this reintroduces 
yeah, something like turns again. Also, it's in real time. But this is not a bad idea because you can say the syn synchronization time is like reintroducing turns and it's yeah, more like a bug. But um, we don't think like that in the, uh, about the synchronization time because I will just introduce you to you three things that, we ca that you can do with the synchronization time that you couldn't do before it. So, I mean, with the cockroach, someone has already done that, turn it into some kind of feature. So, why not us? Okay, so we see it like a feature, the synchronization time, because with the synchronization time, with this time the players have to wait, you can just have a smooth transition from a, yeah, like a real-time game into a turn-based game. So if you have something like a 100-meter sprint versus a garden chess gameplay. So you have this mixture of speed and strategy that you can achieve with the synchronization time. So you can say geo game is like a sports game where you always have to run and be faster than the other player. And this is always the case when the synchronization time turns to zero because then you have just the case that I showed you in the uh, first slide where only the movement um, plays a role, the locomotion of the players, the physical movement. So this is one extreme variant. And you can also have another extreme variant that's where only the strategic elements play a role. So if the synchronization time gets way past zero, uh, so the players have to wait uh, maybe for half an hour at the location, you have the turn-based gameplay as you would have with the pencil and paper game. So now we are interesting in the space between these two extremes because there we can find challenging geo games which where the speed of the players take a role or play a role and the strategic thinking of the players play a role. So this is the thing we are interested in. And what you can also do with the synchronization time is put some educational content in this time slot. So the players have to wait this time, so why not um, let them do some tasks while they wait. Or just hide the synchronization time in the tasks they have to do. So you can put in their location dependent knowledge in the form of quizzes or which is a little bit more interesting for the players, some kind of exploration tasks as you see in the video. So they have to go in some kind of locations to find out what the answer to some quizzes are and yeah, maybe turn some bystanders into game players in the course of it. So this is also possible with the synchronization time because it is also always there and you have to fill it with something. So the game play is not interrupted by some kind of yeah, artificial introduced quizzes or something like that. Okay, but as, as I said before, the most interesting thing now is how to compute the synchronization time. So how do you know how long do you have to put it that there the result is some kind of challenging geo game with speed and strategy. So what you normally do is you do uh, some kind of um, testing with players so that you know if the synchronization time you took is good or is bad. So we have this balancing thing that you also have in strategy games. Um, and you normally do it not in real time, but you simulate the games and look if it's resulting in some kind of challenging or interesting gameplay. And with board games, you normally use the min-max algorithm. That's the same algorithm that is used in chess play um, with the chess computers or with other board games to see if they are fair. So if not one player who begins the a gameplay has an advantage over the second player. And the algorithm is rather simple. You just 
do some kind of uh, simulate all the game states that can happen in a game. So at the first state, you have the max player, which is in our GeoTicket Toe game, the X player. And then you compute all the game states that are possible from this point in time. And after that, the O player is computing all the game states that he can take, all the game plays that he can make. And this you do for all possible game states. And in the end, you get to the bottom. And then you evaluate the bottom um, in this way that you say, OK, either mid or min player wins, the X player, or the O player wins, or it's a draw. And then you go up the tree and evaluate the whole game. And normally what you want to have is a draw, because then no player has an advantage over the other. And if you have a minus one or plus one, the game tends to favor the second or the first player. So this is for turn-taking games. So how do we yeah, change that into something that we can simulate the real-time gameplay of the location-based uh, game GeoTicketO? So yeah. OK, we came up with a spatial-temporal min-max so that we can simulate real-time games with it. So we have this four states. So the player is either waiting the synchronization time, or he decides which location he goes next, or he moves toward this location in the simulation. And changing resources only means that you just set an X or set an O in the GeoTicTacTo game. But the algorithm can be alternated to be um, good for any kind of geo game. So it's more simple. OK, as you have seen before, the normally you have in the min-max algorithms just the state. And then the player decides which or all the game states are computed from this point of view. But this is only the case when you alternate the terms. If you have real-time gameplay, you have to introduce some kind of yeah, time units into the algorithm. So the algorithm just has three additional states. Uh, wait means that you're waiting at the location. Um, the zero is the time units you spend to move from one location to the other or waiting the synchronization time. And you have the resources. In this case, you have only X or O's. So it basically does the same as the normal min-max algorithm, only that now you have more states to compute because you cannot decide in advance which player ha has to decide. So you have to look at the game board and how much time units you have between the game board locations and how fast the players are. Because you can, in this algorithm, you can decide which player is the faster player and how fast he is. So maybe player X is more faster at the first location than the other, and then the turns do not alternate, but the X player gets two turns in a row. So you have just um, to compute all the possible states again with the time units to this location and for the X player, and then for the O player, and then you let just um, yeah, run the time units. So here we're at, at time unit zero. And after four time units, the X player has moved to the first game board location. That's shown here. And then you have a next game state where the X player just decides which, uh, where he wants to go next. And this goes on and on and on, just like the normal min-max algorithm, just that you have this time units introduced. And at the end, you evaluate the game states. And then you can say, OK, with this speed difference, the game is challenging or not. And with this synchronization time, the game is challenging or not. So how do we define challenge in our geo games? So it's, we only look at the death of the search tree in the min-max algorithm. So the more the players have to decide, in the game, 
the more can happen in the gameplay. So also the faster player may have an advantage over the slower player if the game takes normally more than you know, five or six steps into the game tree, more things can happen, like he can uh, hit a dead end or get stuck in the traffic or whatever. So this, the depth of the search tree defines the challenge of the resulting geo game with the synchronization time we introduced uh, before. So if you just let the spatial temporal min max algorithm run through different uh, synchronization time units and through different speed factors. Speed factor means the one player is 5, 10, 15, or 20 percent faster than the other player. Then you simulate all the games and evaluate them and just look how deep the search tree is. Then you get a feeling of how challenging the resulting geo game with a sp specific uh, synchronization time is. So five means um, that it's a race game, so only the faster player, or always the faster player wins, so the search tree always has the depth of five. So for example, X is always um, hitting three in a row, diagonal, or in a column, and the other player is always able to get two other things, but they, does, they don't matter. So if you have a depth of seven, then it's more like an equal match, and if you have a depth of nine, it's more like a board game style because then you always get a draw. So what is interesting is this middle section where you have a search tree depth of seven because there it is not so clear because of the real world conditions which player has the advantage, the faster or the slower player. So this is the place to look at if you simulate all the geo, possible geo games with different synchronization times and different speed factors. And um, yeah, obviously, if you have another game board constellation, the numbers get a little bit changed, but the procedure is the same. So as a game designer now, if I have the game board, I have to decide, OK, normally my players are not more different than 10% in speed. And then I can look at the chart and say, OK, then I want something in the middle. And the synchronization time has to be 5 to result in an yeah, interesting location-based game or geo game. And then you can, um, because these are just neutral time units, you can compute real time units, real seconds um, out of it. So in this case, you have a synchronization time of 104 seconds, which the players have to wait to trigger some kind of game action in the Geo game. In this case, in Geo Tic Tac Toe, to set an X or an O. Okay, so this was the theory behind it. Now I have a video showing that it's also working in the real world and that the players have fun doing this. So as you see, it's always the case that all of our geo games are a mixture of speed, strategy, and yeah, there's always some kind of luck, but we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Um, the starting location you can choose freely, and it's also in. Uh, incorporated in the min max or in the spatial temporal max algorithm. So depending on the starting locations, you may have to choose the synchronization time differently.
<coughs> and as always, we did some yeah, questionnaire work. Um, this is just an example of our yeah, more bigger event. We had at the World Heritage Day 2006 in Bamberg with 36 participants over a whole day. Uh, the age was between 5 and 55, so it really was families playing there, and they really had fun doing it. Um, so these are the basics of the GeoGames uh, research work, GeoGames framework. It's a, a framework to compute the synchronization time and a framework to uh, develop um, the GeoGames for mobile devices in Java, J2ME. And the second part now is um, the most recently work we have done with the City Explorer game, a GeoGame with a purpose. There the focus is a little bit different, but I will come to that now. So our starting point was the work from Louis van Aan. Don't know if you, somebody knows it. It's the idea that you can um, motivate just voluntary internet users to produce uh, meaningful data just by, for example, tagging images. So they produced a game where two players have to tag uh, a game similarly to get points so that this data can be used by search engines like Google Images or whatever. And we thought about taking this idea and into, uh, implementing a location-based mobile game out of it. So what normally you have this hard AI problems that you want to solve by letting uh, humans play this game which computers cannot do uh, right now. So we came up with this AI problem. So the question here is what can you see? What, which elements can you identify in this picture? It's actually uh, from Raleigh somewhere. <laughs> so what can you identify? Right? Mm -hmm. Do you also know which church it is? Do you know the name of the building? Okay. So you can see that it is also rather difficult for humans to identify objects in this picture. And also, um, yeah, put some uh, semantic data in it, like the street names or whatever. So it's even more difficult for computers to do right now. So we thought about, let's just build a location-based mobile game which collects this kind of data. And you cannot do this in a yeah, browser game way because it's very difficult, as I said, for humans to identify this object. So you have to really go out and be on the streets to do this kind of work. So we came up with a um, location-based mobile game. This is just the, um, yeah, the theoretical background we did before we uh, constructed a location-based mobile game, so we had this hierarchy of uh, data that you can collect with such games. It's uh, location, localization, communication network data, so GPS coverage, Wi-Fi coverage that you can collect while playing a location-based mobile game, or data about the geographic environment, that's uh, vector data, so road networks or whatever, without semantics. And you can also collect non-geographical information like opening times of theaters, of restaurants, the card that they have, and combined non-geographic and geographic data, the geospatial data, which is the combination of just the GPS location maybe and a name or a classification of the point of interest. 
So the information content goes up. And you can construct at every level a location-based mobile game that collects this kind of data. And we thought about a game which collects geospatial data, so GPS data combined with some kind of semantics. So as we always do in Germany, we have many board games. So we just took another board game and transformed it into a yeah, location-based or geo game. So does anybody know Carcassonne? There's always one person in the room. OK, two. <laughs> so the gameplay is rather simple. You have this pile of tiles. And every turn, a player chooses a tile and attaches the tile to the already laying game board. You start with an empty game board. And there are geographic features on these tiles. And you are allowed to put one of your game markers, followers, on such a geographic um, feature, like a road or church or a part of a city. And when all tiles are laid and all fellows are set, you get points for it. So this rather simple gameplay we uh, introduced in our location-based mobile game we call City Explorer. And it's this one here. Um, so it has two components, one online component and one mobile component, because yeah, the problem with location-based mobile games is always that you have to have good weather, because when it's raining, you can't play it. So we thought, OK, we have this mobile component where you have to go out in the streets and collect the data, and you have the online component, which you can also play if the weather is not so good. So in the beginning, like in the Carcassonne game, the game board is empty, and you just have these predefined tiles there. And the gameplay is also rather simple, um, but not as restrictive as the Carcassonne game, where you have these three predefined uh, classes of locations you can set your followers at. So we thought about um, why not let the players, uh, this animation is not working. Um, so. The players in the beginning of the game can um, decide which classes of locations they can set their markers at. So in this case, they said, OK, we have um, the classes hotel, restaurant, and church. And we can set our game markers, our virtual game markers, at this kind of locations, real world locations. So I'm only allowed to set my virtual markers at churches in the game area, at hotels, and at restaurants. So every time you play this game, it's always different because you can choose different classes of locations you collect the data for. And in uh, our current implementation, every player can choose three categories of locations so that it's a little bit more fairer if I'm not knowing the locations of churches in the game area. I can choose just another uh, class of location, maybe pa uh, pubs or uh, restaurants or whatever. Um, so the players then, after this uh, initial step, go out and collect the data. Then they come back, upload the data to the website, and then it's visualized there. And in the end, you have this whole collection of um, yeah, toys with the GPS coordinates and the semantics. And the winning conditions, I would say, are rather simple. Um, every player who has the majority of markers in such a tile gets some points. And every player who has the majority in a class of locations get some points, and the player with the most points win the game at the end. So we also um, have a rather, yeah, it looks complicated process of placing a marker. That's uh, because we want to get the most data out of it. So to place a marker, you have to do the following. You have to take a photo of the location you want to place the, your marker at. then walk as near to the object of interest 
and then just choose the category, the right category for the location. And in step one and four, we um, yeah, record the GPS coordinates for it so that we can reconstruct the viewing areas uh, at which angle the photo was taken from. And we also have the semantic data with it. Um, we also had built some uh, clustering algorithm that uses this kind of information, but it will not go into detail for that here. So at the end, you have this whole collection of uh, geographic information, geospatial information, that you can also use for location-based services later on or whatever you want to do with it. And um, as you can see here, um, the game takes place not on one specific uh, time slot, but it's played um, maybe a whole week or whatever, so the players can really uh, take their time to collect the data and play the game and go out when they want, to, when they have spare time. So we did um, also do some uh, case studies with it, but the most significant or most important part in this kind of data collection game is the quality um, improvement, I would say, because here the game markers cannot be checked if the, uh, the position is the correct one or the classification is the correct one because nobody predefined uh, this kind of data uh, before the game took place. So the game software itself cannot um, identify if a marker is at the correct location or has the correct classification. So the players have to do this. So we implemented a kind of um, yeah, peer reviewing process, I would say, and we have some extrinsic uh, motivation for it because the player who does the most reviewing work, so who checks all the other markers from the other players, um, gets points in the end. So this is also a very important part. And as I had said before, we did some case studies with it. So we had three case studies that lasted seven, nine, and four days in the city of Bamberg with different um, yeah, amount of players and different amount of uh, geographic data we got out of it. And we also did some um, yeah, multi-city game, we call it. So we let one team in Japan play against a team in uh, Bamberg. And the good thing here is with this kind of game is that you only have to map the two game boards as a whole. You don't have to map uh, the game board locations as you would have to do it in the geo tic tac toe game. So this was rather simple. So just um, to get an idea, this middle section in the city of Japan was mapped to the middle section here in the city of Bamberg. And naturally, you had to uh, decide which classes of location you have here and here but that um, did the player themselves, so we didn't do nothing here with the game software. So it's a rather yeah, game-driven, gamer-driven um, kind of game. Um, so we also did some quantity and qualitative inspection of the collection, the data collection we got out of it. The main problem is right now that um, only about 40% of the collected geospatial data was reviewed by the players. So the other 60%, we cannot say if it's good or bad because nobody looked at it. So this is the problem right now, um, but it mainly has something to do with the uh, graphical user interface, I think, and the motivation of the players. Um, what we also did was look at the positional accuracy of the yeah, data we collected, the 40% that were reviewed by the players, and it's in the average or in the medium case, it's rather good. So the players had only in the right charts, it says that on the average, the players had to correct the initial data of the other players by 40 meters. So it was rather good. And the graph shows 
uh, a comparison with Google Maps um, points where the median was that our data we collected differed uh, yeah, on the median case 17 meters from the Google Maps entries. So um, it's also rather good. Um, but the last thing we did was to um, think about a more intrinsic way to motivate the players to produce initially better data than they did at the City Explorer game. So we came up with the Geosnake experiment. Um, there the idea was that we had just one simple rule that would um, motivate or intrinsically motivate the players to produce better data. So we took the wisdom of the crowd approach. So we had this game where you have to um, just determine geographic positions or locations of two real world locations that are in pictured here. So the players had to go there, just record the GPS coordinate for it and go on. And they weren't or they were punished if they took one street twice or just crossed their street, just in the, like in the snake game. And um, they had to change the rule to determine the geographic position of the real world location. So in the first case, in the first six locations, they took rule one. So they just determined the location of the um, St. Stephen Church, for example, um, like they would do it. And in the second rule, they choose the position they saw the other players would choose for the St. Stephen's Church, for example. So we thought that this would produce, with the rule two, some better results than with rule one. So that they um, would think about, oh, maybe this is not a good position here because the others are taking another position. And then they would uh, just choose the position you normally would choose if you determine a real world uh, location. So just showing you a brief example of the results we got. So this is the positions we got for um, a location called Geiersworth in Bamberg. So the red markers are for rule one and the blue markers are for rule two. And as you can see in the picture, the blue markers are more crowded in one place than the red markers. So in this case, it really produced um, a more precise um, positioning by taking rule two. So if you would um, produce a centroid out of this uh, blue locations, they would represent better because here is Skylesworth normally than the red dots. And we did this for all the 12 locations with 12 players and rule two produced um, better results with a significance uh, level of 98%. So this was the last piece we did um, just recently. It's not yet published, but I just wanted to show the things that we are thinking about right now. Okay, now I get to the last part, the assignments. Um, and this is also two of the research topics we uh, researched with our GeoGames framework or GeoGames project. So we had this uh, idea of maybe an impossible concept, I don't know. We came up with some idea, but um, just to create a game taking into account the following constraints. So the game is to be played along a linear feature, so along a river or along a biking trail or whatever. And the players, they don't want to get forth and back. They just want to get from A to B. So the, play, the game is really played um, alongside the biking or whatever. And as a more heavier constraint, you can leave that out if you want to do it, um, the game has to be played by two players on a single mobile device. So that the family that only has one iPhone or one Blackberry can play together uh, while they are biking along the biking trail. So this is the first assignment. And the hint there is our solution we came up with. 
So if you're interested, you can look it up. And the second assignment is a little bit more technical. So we had this idea, as I have shown you with the City Explorer game, where we had these two cities playing against each other, that sometimes you don't have the yeah, amount of players you need to play a location-based mobile game. So you want to have some kind of possibility to play against the team in another city. And if the game features some predefined um, geographic locations, you have to have um, some kind of solution to match an existing game board with another game board in another city so that the two game boards are fair in a sense that I don't have to move 10 kilometers and the other player has only to move 10 meters. Um, would be a little bit unfair for me in this case. So the assignment here or the question here is which measurements or similarity values you can compute to just get this uh, game board matching done. Okay, so that was the end of my talk. Oh, on, on assignment uh, two, okay. is that for any arbitrary game or for a fixed game? Because it seems like for any arbitrary game, um, it's a much harder problem. We came up with a solution um, for the CD poker game, but it can be um, yeah, realized for any game. At least for games where you have predefined game board locations. Uh, okay. So you, if you have no game board locations and it's more like a real time game where you have to catch someone or something like that, it's more, it's harder. So I'm wondering. Because you have satellite images in your dem in your presentation, um, and also as as you you were talking about Raleigh and the the satellite pictures you had, and people had read, readily identified by shape, church, um, that that would be part of the answer to assignment two, where you could do shape recognition on a city map, satellite image, and and locate key features. That's true. So, um, when so you showed that um, the game at the very beginning about uh, matching words about parts of an image. Um, so the ESP game. Yeah. Yes, the ESP game, and that game isn't so far away from sort of random idle web browsing that people do. Kind of, you know. So it's not a big jump to go from browsing their web and reading news to playing that game. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of the games, the uh, geo games that you talk about, they require a bigger leap from what I normally do during the day, right? So, but on the other hand, there are a lot of times when I am out in the city moving around, like riding a train to work or, or you know, going to run errands or something like that. And I wonder if you thought about integrating the types of games that you're talking about into things that make it more uh, for casual game, you know, casual geo gamers. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's the reason why we set the time period you can play the City Explorer game so long so that you can, if you're going uh, shopping or whatever and you see and you're walking besides or alongside the street and see a church, then you just pick out your phone and click uh, on the photo and uh, place a marker there. So this was the idea that the game time is so long and that you have this asynchronous gameplay where you can upload your game markers to the website, see what the other players have done throughout the day, and then do something next day. That's true, yeah.
Um, the geo games, which are played with mobile device, we implemented the geo game software framework where we can implement any kinds of geo games. It's in JTME, so it's supported by any mobile device that supports Java. And um, for the City Explorer game, we also uh, implemented some kind of server application with a Google Maps um, kind of overlay. So. In the game where you, um, you've got a better location for the object and you had rule one and rule two, I was just curious, I noticed in the data that you presented, only about one in the five tracked the same location that they took the picture. Um, did you find that, yeah, if you go back to that, the red represents the, where they took the picture and the blue is where they thought other people took the picture, right? So I only noticed one red in the middle of the blue, assuming that, I'm assuming, I could be incorrect in that, but that one person might have said that I took the picture from here and I would assume that other people would take the picture from here. I was just wondering if you asked or if you found out why people would assume people would take the picture from a different location than themselves or if you asked that question or uh, uh, what asked, information you have about that. What we asked was, if the transition from rule one to rule two really um, affected their kind of determining where the real world location were. But the, the answer always was no. So the player thought that there was no difference between rule and rule one and two in their behavior, but the data shows that there was. Did you ask them why they didn't initially take the picture from where they would have thought everyone else mm -hmm. would take the picture? No, we didn't ask that. I'm just curious <laughs> about the mindset behind that. I mean, it's good that you got better data. <laughs> so did one group get rule one and another group get rule two? Or did um, one group get have to do both? The one, all of the players had to do both okay. rules, but we switched the, um, the way um, the, uh, I'm trying to find the word. Um, so we always switched between the players the, um, if they start with rule one or if they start with rule two. Yeah, But they uh, could choose by themselves which locations they wanted to do with rule one or rule two. So that was good. Uh, I noticed for one of the games you had families and things coming in. Mm. Uh, did you do some training for how to use the GPS units or were they all just using things that they already had? I know we give them our devices. Uh -huh. So they had a mobile phone and a separate GPS device. Okay. Taught them how to use it? Yeah, we give them a short introduction. Yeah. Yeah. And that worked out well for them. And so all the units had the same kind of accuracy? Uh, yes. They were all the same. People wanted to take pictures, not necessarily wanted to evaluate other people's work or this and that. Have you looked at motivation in general as a variable? Like what motivates people to do what they do? Um, you mean for the City Explorer game or? Well, in general, what makes games meaningful for people? So, um, no, we have. Um, this kind of theoretical work we haven't done now. a game and I'm wondering is that like after one play or is that after 10 plays or um, I think the range of those participants were between 5 and 55 so there's some sort of cultural implications about technology there mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get a better sense of just how um, sort of uh, I guess 
flushing out those kinds of questions and implications out mm -hmm. between those, that big of an age group. And then I think the idea what a game would be, um, you know, multiple times. And so mm -hmm. it's not so much fun after the third time. If you are like 35, <laughs> if you're five, <laughs> maybe the game is fun all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, in this uh, case study, they only played the game once. I mean, we had some players who played it uh, twice, but they were all younger, so that's true. And we also asked them, because we did this geotechnical game, which has the mixture of speed and strategy, if they want more strategy elements or more speed elements. And it was the case that the older players always wanted to have more strategy elements than the younger players. So that's true, yeah. So for the most part, your, your survey is a win play. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I don't know. I just <laughs> took a picture of somewhere in Raleigh. <laughs> I thought you maybe uh, know where it is. <laughs> I assume this is part of your doctoral research? Uh, the second part, yes. The second part, and um, therefore I was curious, uh, are there any hypotheses that you're asserting at first with respect to the results and that you're trying to uh, prove or disprove in your, in your doctoral research? Um, yeah, I must say that the doctor thesis is more about finding algorithms because I'm from computer science. So the thesis is more about what you can do with the collected data <coughs> Not so much about um, how you collect the data. So it's more about this picture here. So it's about to find um, some algorithms that take into case in the clustering process not only the geometric data or geometric distances, but also the semantics. 